see the updated version of the solutions to the first homework. The only difference from the previous you know, version that I gave you um, is some lines of the code were, remember you had to solve an equation symbolically. You got two solutions and only one was relevant the other one being extraneous, like negative, and, and he, wanted, he wanted only the positive solution. It's very important that you pick the positive solution when you do the sensitivity or whatever. Um, so I'm just going to show it here a little bit. So just so you know, so just discard the previous one. Uh, the reason for that change came from um, when I wrote this code, I was using an older version of the symbolic toolbox. And um, believe it or not, when they change this versions, sometimes the um, yeah, like take this one. Sometimes the capabilities change just a little bit. Nobody really can predict that. But of course, if you run the the code that was write, written for the old version on the new version, then you might get something. So just just point out. One, one such change. Um, yeah, for instance, some some are like here. Okay, so in problem number seven, when I had to solve, well, one solves. It says the derivative equal to zero and finds the point, the critical points. And it gives you two two values, right? You have to be able to pick the positive one. And I believe in the previous solutions, I, the code was saying pick the second one. Of course, you can make the code uh, fancier and say check which one's positive, right? You could write a little, you know, two lines that says, you know, pick only the positive ones. But um, so now, how do you realize which one is the positive? Well, you could display them in, in a numerical mode and then see them, or um, I mean, various ways. Um, or if it is like, take this one here. And see, that's that's kind of weird, isn't it? Um, when you introduce a, a parameter and you solve the same, you know, kind of optimization problem. But this time, this time you have a parameter in it. I believe that's the same. Yeah, that's the same problem. But now I have a parameter, and I solve. I set the derivative equal to zero. Take a look. It's the second one that corresponds to a positive solution. So you can. I don't think you can ever predict. So it's just case by case. You can. Right. And how do I know this? The second one is the positive. I know the first one. Plug it. Plug in some values, right? For instance, you can plug in the value g is uh, whatever it was originally, right? The, the value that you departed from. I don't remember what what was g. G was some sort of uh, growth rate. So if it's plug in five in here, and you'll see is the second one that comes up. Okay. It's hard to see from the expression that this is really the positive one, right? So you just have to try, uh, to try it. Anyway, so um, those of you that came in a little bit late, if I didn't have enough copies, um, there are more copies. But it's on any companion, you should hear, see the, the, 
the most accurate one. Well, the one that works with the latest version. Okay? Or the, the la last few versions of, of uh, the symbolic toolbox. Okay, so uh, just a general comment about the homework is um, it's quite important that you uh, include whether it's handwritten or you know in the published version just you, you include some comments some conclusion just giving the code and the output of the code in a graph uh, makes it hard for me to you know to uh, judge anything so having some conclusions is important even if even if you start with wrong assumptions, maybe not wrong, but maybe there, there, you interpret the problem in a very special, specific, in your, you know, and it's not the same as somebody else would interpret the same wording. Okay, the more, but as long as you write that down, that's my assumption, and then at the, at the end you, you draw the conclusion, you know, based on those assumptions. That to me is a valid piece of work. Okay. Now. If the assumptions are totally off, you know, we can, uh, you know, we can debate, you know, we can talk about it. Uh, but if the if the conclusions to your, you know, modeling process are, you know, following, you know, correct reasoning, and the model is correct, right? Then then there is no. It's not like it's totally wrong. Okay, even though you might draw different conclusions that. Than other people, you know, it might, it might be, you know, seven days compared to five days, right, or something like that. How did you I think if you put star around before and after the words, um, the, I mean, you can make this pretty error. I mean, I don't think you can make it uh, the pretty ever um, perfect. This publishing feature in HTML, the best way to uh, publish code is uh, to LaTeX, but if you don't know LaTeX, uh, uh, it's a mute point. So uh, so we're not really looking to make it, and as I said, you hand, handwriting it is even is, is equally go good. Okay, so I did take points off just because I want to make this point um, clear, you know, so I did take points off in the, in the homework if you uh, didn't include, you know, some sort of conclusions. And some of you have included conclusions, but in, in places where I didn't expect. So I have a few comments that I, I stretch, uh, scratch, scratched out. Um, nevertheless, um, kind of think about the last step is very important, you know, where you kind of uh, convey your, your results. Um, yeah, the grades are, should be posted on a companion. Um, let's see, any other general comments about this homework? Um, um, I think some, sometimes, like in this next homework, chapter two, um, there will be, again, some departures from well, the situation that uh, you deal with is, is kind of different than the example that I gave you in class. So I think that's, you know, make that effort, uh, make the best uh, effort to uh, interpret, you know, within the limits, sort of make it as simple as possible, the assumptions as simple as possible. Um, I think even in the first homework there were, there was at least one that made the interpretation slightly different of that number of rebates that creates 15% increase in sales. Uh, one of the assumptions was that's a linear increase, right? So if you double the rebates, that's going to double the number of sale increase, right? But you could interpret it as being kind of cumulative, so it would be exponential increase, right? And that's an assumption, but that's certainly not an assumption that would work well for large rebates okay so 
just in that uh, auto sale problem. I think the uh, linear assumption that you make is giving you what four hundred dollars in rebates, um, which is not really unheard of, right? In the I guess in the auto industry. Um, now they even say half price cars, right? I don't know how that can be, but you know that's just an advertising uh, ploy. Um, but anyway, so if you change that, assumption, if you interpret the assumption as being it's not a linear increase, but it's like exponential increase, then I think the maximum occurs at 800 or 700 something uh, in rebates, right? So it's not. I mean, if you, it's not wrong, right? Neither of the two is wrong. But um, the fact that you can expect that, you know, the statement says for each $100 rebate, there is a 15% increase in, in sales. And to assume that after 707 of those rebates, the model keeps growing exponentially, that I think is not so, is not, uh, you know, sustainable sort of in a market. So that, that's where you kind of get a bite on, on the assumption that you've made. Okay, it's not in the, you know, how the, the code follows. You know, it's just, I mean, you've done it correctly. It's just to start with, the, with different assumptions. And I don't know if anybody um, has checked the website, but I put here like a cartoon that talks about how the assumptions, you know, making, you know, you can make your own assumptions that, uh, the report then uh, gives whatever you want, right? So, um, anyway, I kind of hit it here at the bottom, but um, okay. So, let me uh, come back to this constraint optimization. Um, and I want to make a comment about uh, that code. So we, we mostly talked about constraint optimization for uh, the situation of that two color TVs, types of color TVs, where you have some sort of um, constraint on the production level, so on the total number of units. And I believe if I, uh, you remember I was talking about the sum of the two things being less than whatever it was maybe ten thousand dollars and then I was I drew this and I said you know that's the feasible region is therefore that triangle right so again feasible region means it's the set of all uh, points in the state space so in this in, in basically the space where the variables live that you know obey those constraints, and we said some cannot exceed ten thousand. So that's where this was. But I think the actual problem was having two additional constraints. If you read it carefully, there was also a constraint on the each individual type was constrained to be something less than something. I think one was five thousand, one was eight thousand. So, so really, again, the, it's probably not worth to kind of make a uh, picture pretty on a computer. But it would actually be five thousand here would be the first type. So that would be a bound for the first uh, whatever the X one was, one type of color TV, and eight thousand was for the other one. Has anybody caught that? It's a long, it's a long, uh, right? So it has. Right, it only has you know the supplier only uh, supplies eight thousand for a twenty-one inch and five thousand for a nineteen inch. Okay, so it it really should be 
I don't know if I can draw it. I don't want to. Um, but if you, if I were to draw, it should be this, right? So I mean, let me let me just run this. See what it is. Yeah, I was doing 10,000, but it should really be 5,000 to 8,000 here. Okay. It's a little bit annoying here, too. Change the code, but anyway, so. Um, changing the code of life doesn't work, right? I mean, you have to do it. May take time to uh, get it right, but anyway, so it's it's really this eight thousand, and then there is this line which is the sum of the two less than ten thousand, right? So on paper, I'm, uh, it's you know instead of making a nice picture on the computer, you can um, see it here. So the constraint TV problem uh, has. The following feasible region, so it's 5,000, 8,000, like this, and then there is this 10,000 thing at 45 degree, and then this. So this is x1 plus x2 less than 10,000. Okay, so uh, to write this kind of correctly or, or uh, completely would be that you want to maximize profit uh, subject to to three constraints And those are x1 less than or equal than 5,000, x2 less than or equal than 8,000, x1 plus x2 less than or equal than 10,000. And um, well, we can add this that uh, both values have to be positive, but I don't. Um, Oftentimes we don't include this as the as the real constraints. These are just constraints. Even if you didn't have um, additional ones included, so so this well this region is called the feasible region, right? So this is going to be the feasible set or feasible. It's inside this region that you look for the uh, optimal value for, for your profit. If it's a function of two variables, um, what we've, we've found, so through optimization, uh, we found through Lagrange multipliers, right? That the max, the maximum, um, the maximum occurs where it actually occurs on this um, piece of the of the region, on the piece of the boundary, and the valleys were. Let's see if you remember. my published version but um, anybody remembers what it was so it was somewhere here like four thousand and and three uh, about four thousand and about eight uh, six thousand 
3,800 and 600, 100, right? So it was about um, 300, 3,800. I don't know, and 600, 2,000, uh, 6,200. Okay, and uh, even even if we don't impose the other two constraints, right? This, or if we impose or we don't impose, these values, you know, lie within the other two constraints. So, so that'll be the the optimal, or the point where the optimal value of the profit. Resize. But uh, it would be possible that as you move whatever parameter, as you change a parameter in your model, what happens? That maximum might slide up or down, right? And it might actually, if the change is large enough, it might actually run into one of the other constraints. Okay? So then. So it's important that you you kind of set all all the uh, possible uh, constraints from the beginning. So okay. You don't have to check. Like I know it's here, so you check the whole region. You have to you check the whole. Critical points in the region. So you say something about. So you check the x one to equal to ten thousand boundary, but you didn't check the other two. Right. You would have to check all the boundaries. You do have to check all the boundaries. Um, but do you have to check it using Lagrange multipliers? Uh, like, if do you, like the question is, do you do you have to go on this and do Lagrange multipliers for each piece of the boundary, right? Because it's just that's the same as just setting x one to five thousand. Exactly. But you do have. I mean, in principle, you do have to do that because. It's possible that that he, this peak might be actually higher than anything else, even though you don't have any critical points inside, right? But the value at this point is the maximum possible, right? Now that's where you know it's um, kind of a plot. It's not a proof, but it kind of tells you well uh, the maximum cannot be there. So if you if you were to plot it here, you see how it's increasing, right? So if you were to plug in x1, uh, 5,000 for x1 in your profit function, and you can do that easily, right? Um, then, and you would graph that, you would see that it's actually always increasing on that piece, right? Of the boundary, as well as on that piece. So the maximum really occurs on that slanted piece. And then you, you apply a Lagrange multiplier to that, right? You want to minimize the number of the portions of the regions that you you can uh, you have to do the Lagrange multipliers. Does it make sense? So a combination of plotting and you know reasoning uh, is in the end it's the, the thing is you want to make sure you don't you know you don't it doesn't it's something escapes you so that the conclusions get are wrong, right? Um, any other questions? So we talked about sensitivity to um, to to this constraint, to the to the to the constraint value, right? And we said that if we change this uh, and we compute the derivative of the optimal value of the, of the optimal in this case profit to the the parameter that stands for the constraint then that ends up being exactly what hmm? so it says sensitivity to uh, the constraint parameter, so in this case, g of x1, x2 equals 
in this case was a sum, but this equals to c, so this is parameter c, uh, was giving that the derivative of the um, of the optimal profit, which is a function of c in the end, that numerical value is, is exactly the same as the Lagrange multiplier, the value of the Lagrange multiplier that you found from the method, right? Right? So that's the last thing we talked about. We said we gave a reason why this is the case, right? And we also said that this is called the shadow price. And why was called shadow price? Because because if because the derivative is nothing but uh, the the ratio between a change in the parameter um, and the change in or, or and the ch and the resulting change in the optimal profit. Right? And if, so this is if delta C is small, right, compared to, to C itself, right? So if, if, if C is large, like 10,000, then delta C being 1, so you have some sort of production. So shadow, wow, uh, shadow price is, I don't think it's a universal. Uh, concept. I mean, it has to be applied in some sort of production scenario, or where you have, where you can talk about additional units, additional items that you're producing or selling, or some some sort. So if this is, so if this is considered small, right? Of course, if you are producing only ten pieces of something, then it wouldn't make sense to say, well, one additional piece is not really, it's not small, it's not a small change, right? It's a, it's a big change. But if you have 10,000, then um, then additional, so one additional unit um, it means that this is the pro additional profit um, optimal profit, right? It's, it's it's basically the it's you, you kind of look focusing on that optimal strategy that gives you the optimal profit when you have c number of units compared to the c plus one number of units. Okay, so so that in our example was lambda uh, was uh, excuse me was d y d c was twenty four and this was dollars. Right, that actually means it means that um, allowing uh, one additional um, unit to be produced uh, yields an additional $24 in profit. Okay, so that's sort of the reason for that uh, shadow. Uh, shadow price. Okay. Um, let's see. Any questions from from the problems that I assigned? Yeah. Uh, which one? Problem number five. Problem number five, part A. So this is a unconstrained TV problem. So here you have basically exactly the same um, revenue. 
function as as before the pr uh, the only the, the cost well the profit is decreased by twenty five dollar per unit right so you have a you have a different objective function right that you need to maximize so you're going to get a different optimal value right so the op the maximum profit you can make in this situation is going to be some some number right so it's going to be achieved as some optimal x1, x2, right? And I think the second question in part A is just saying, um, what is the tariff that you're going to, when you, when, you, when you achieve that optimal profit, what is going to be the tariff you're going to pay the government? So, so it's just $25 times the sum of the x1 and x2. But it's also asking you how much do you lose in sales total? No, and that, that's just uh, comparing to the original. the original without tariffs. Oh, right. So if, you're, if your original revenue was 700000 and your new revenue is 500000 then you, you, you lost $200,000 in lost opportunity or lost sales. Lost right. And that's also in part because your optimal strategy probably is going to change. I mean, it has to change. Well, most likely it's going to change in the number of units produced for each type so that's gonna create a you know a different um, different profit right so the sum of the two will not actually necessarily give you the the optimal profit right uh, let's see I, I think I should I should emphasize again the uh, importance of, of of choosing the right variables to start with, which I think in this case is fairly clear, right? Or not? You see, it kind of starts talking about decision variables. So, whenever we whenever we uh, we specify these are going to be our variables, and then we're going to write our objective function in terms of those variables, those variables. Think about them as decision variables because you're going to have to make the decision based on the model. You're going to have to make a decision on what those two variables will be, right? So, so your um, x1, x2 are you know um, for problem six, for instance, they even tell you price and advertising. Um, for problem number five, well, it's the same as the unconstrained, right? So there, there are a few kind of important steps to follow here, especially when you have constraint. Make sure you have this feasible region that's um, respecting all the constraints. OK. So any other questions? Yeah. No, they're posted on the website. But if you need ex uh, we can make appointments. Uh, let's move to chapter three. So, I mean, we're, we could spend a lot of time on uh, on each of these type of problems. Um, I think what we want to do is we want to start revisiting some of these assumptions. For instance, the assumption that things grow linearly. When you say, like I said uh, earlier, if you have some uh, change in um, in um, I don't want to call it a parameter, but if you if you every hundred dollar rebates creates this much uh, added uh, sales, right? That translates in a, you have to make the assumption that there's going to be a linear increase, right? But that's not always uh, true. I mean. Maybe maybe on a short span it looks linear, right? But it, but maybe in the long term, in, and in general, in long term, nothing stays linear, right? Uh, so I think the first task is to uh, change that linear assumption in the pig problem um, because that was a kind of very simple uh, situation. So so we need to kind of remember what that um, problem said. And look at the growth rate, I believe.
So um, revisit uh, the pig problem. Uh, by changing the uh, the linear assumptions on the growth, um, let's see which one is the first growth rate, right? Growth rate of the pig. Maybe I shouldn't say growth rate, but the growth of the pig. So. If, if we say the growth rate initially was 5 pounds per day, right? That means that the, gro the, uh, the weight was whatever it was initially plus 5 times t, right? So that's a linear growth. So instead of that, um, they're going to say, "Do it." Think about it as a um, nonlinear growth. So, so the growth rate will no longer be constant. So, new assumption. So this is the old assumption. New assumption. is that um, the weight as a function of t is nonlinear. And uh, of course it's debatable what what is the true you know what is the true um, function that describes that but It might not make, uh, you know, it might make sense to think about uh, something that grows. It is exponentially, but it's with a very small constant here. So in the end, the uh, slope initially is the same as the linear growth, right? So if you take the derivative of this and set it equal to uh, at time zero, you would get what? You get 200 times. 0 0.0 to 5, and that should be 5, right? So this slope is, is again, initially is the same, yeah, the growth rate. Uh, yeah, but it's commutative. Uh, every day. Well, not really, because because at later days is going to grow actually faster than it's it's really, it's it. The growth rate is kind of depending of where it's actually it's like 2 compounded, every day. compounded exactly. Yeah, so it's a compounded rate, right? Um, compounded continuously, right? Yeah. So that's okay. So um, now this is not sustainable. I mean, for Right. I mean, after four days, probably you're going to have to adjust this model, right? And use a different different model. Um, but the, the the point is of this exercise is to indicate how difficult it is to perform the same task that we performed in first chapter um, com computationally. Okay. So computationally, we're not going to be as lucky as um, Going to the computer and asking for okay, find me the maximum. You know, then when I do sensitivity, find me the, again the solution as as a function of that parameter, plot it and and walk away. Okay, so so very soon you'll see that just relying on symbolic computation and symbolic uh, solutions of, of of equations, it's not going to be um, the way to go. And even in you know, simple examples like such as this one. So, um, right. So, so basically, the um, new profit 
function is going to be again x was uh, what x was the number of days right which was t in effect uh, was 0 0.6 I'm just gonna write down um, the model which is now um, I forgot this was a market price right and you see market price assumption is that uh, it drops one cent per day and again in a linear fashion yeah so you're just ch changing one assumption in the growth of the uh, the weight of the weight growth so minus I think this was the cost of okay so now the the task is maximize F again um, X has to be positive so it, it doesn't seem like anything uh, dra dra uh, well dramatically different than what we did in chapter one does it take the derivative set it equal to zero okay except let's try to run this so I think I have I posted the um, what I call nonlinear pig here code so that's just example 3.1 in the book and you see the, um, the new function right so I'm just gonna run it cell by cell by the way somebody asked me about how can you actually type comments uh, within code and the easiest is to create a cell but don't don't name it anyway and just make comments underneath and when you publish this is gonna look just like a text but um, so you can make cells without names now if I put a name here this is gonna actually show as a subsection or something uh, okay so let's run this okay so we so the first thing is to plot right we get an idea of what's what's the thing that you look at and I don't well okay I said between 0 and 40 how do I know 40 is the right number right but before you get this graph if you don't say if you do 0 to 300 so so really you have to go through do this once and figure out where where the critical points might be and then then um, then you adjust the graph uh, differentiate this it probably did I get an error here no okay uh, it doesn't look pretty here but so let me run again and I don't know you don't have to display it um, but actually it's a good it's a good thing to compare this with what it was in chapter one in chapter one our objective function was quadratic the derivative was linear and you could take that by hand and figure out the, where the derivative equal to zero right whereas here this is how the derivative looks and this and then you have to set this equal to zero so what happens when you have exponentials and 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 polynomials in an equation you need to try to solve explicitly uh, you could run out of luck now it wasn't the case here because you know something happened and it was able to solve it okay uh, did it solve it let's see if I display this can we see what it is well you can see what it is it is no longer an explicit function that you can write down right it's actually something that called Lambert so that's kind of a new function right an exotic function that the computer happened to have it in you know because somebody 300 years ago figured you know this kind of equation is important to solve so let's just give it a name just to, to the roots but okay and so anyway we can solve this and we get 20 90.47 right so that's 
the number of days in this model, if this model were to be valid for that long of a period, right, then this would be where the maximum, uh, where the maximum profit would be. Correct? Based on the growth rate, right? Which is already kind of, uh, I mean, it's kind of, you cannot really say this is a good, good model, right? Because uh, after 20 days, if you compute the, the weight of the pig, it's going to be probably something, you know, that you don't see in reality, okay? Um, uh, nevertheless, so let's see what the profit is here. Okay, 139. I don't know if you remember. Before it was 133, right? With the linear growth. And only after eight days, right? So this is not a huge improvement uh, in the profit. Uh, let's see. So what is... Okay. So, um, maybe I'll talk about this in a second. But the point is that it's uh, very soon we will not be able to rely on the computer solving e equations explicitly for us. Uh, so there is an alternative numerical way of doing it, and it's something that you probably heard, Newton's method. So that's kind of an implementation of the Newton's method. Um, and it leads, after a few iterations, so I'll, just, I'll talk about this in a second, it leads to about the same uh, value that you would um, well, that we did find. Uh, fortunately, we found it. Okay. But here's, so I'm going to go back, come back to this. But the, here, the, the big point is, when you do sensitivity, that's when you kind of run into troubles with symbolic computations. So can you guess why? Let me go here. I don't. I don't think I even. It's even in the code here. But let me. Let me take this. And, it, and right now we're going to do sensitivity to uh, R, which is the growth rate. Is the growth rate? No. Okay. What's the sensitivity to? One cent drop. Yep. So it's the price. Uh, I mean the um, yeah, it's the price drop. This is with respect to R, and I think later we do with respect to C, which is the uh, no. The um, there's no constraint. Is the um, 0.025? That's the growth rate. Okay. When it's compounded continuously, right? Okay. So which one do you want to do? You want to try symbolically. C. Okay, let's try C. So, let me just take this. I'm going to do it uh, separately from this. Okay, so I'm going to, let's say I start from, I, I know nothing, right? And the computer knows nothing now. Um, so, what I do is I just introduce the X and the C. And now I just define this and I put C instead of this. To, uh, 0.025. Okay? So that's a function. And now what do I, do I want to do? I want to differentiate. So now, believe it or not, differentiation is not... Symbolic differentiation is... Well, as long as you see the expressions, you know, the computer knows. If you can write an expression, then the computer uh, knows how to differentiate. So that's not a big deal. But now here's the... Uh, uh, I hope... When you want to solve this with respect to x, right? You want to call this x max. I don't know if x max c, right? So it gives this Lambert again, right? Um, Let me try with, um, I want to see if this can do it with the value here. Let me see that. 
Okay, it's still finite because it's the same type of equation, right? So it can do, it has exponentials and it has polynomials in it. Yeah. Um, right, and actually, this is what I was hoping that I would see too. Um, so the point is, that, I mean, the the point is that you can, depending on the version that you run, the the symbolic. Um, you know, capabilities that you have in your version. Uh, the newer versions can solve, well, this is not really solving it explicitly, right? But it can find, if it can represent the solution in some, using some fancy functions, right? So it's possible that previous versions, or the versions you run, doesn't have that powerful of a symbolic kernel, right? This is 2009. Something in the, in the, in the, in the kernel it differs, right? It's, I cannot explain. The symbolic thing is, is, is a mystery to me, how it works and how it comes up to this. Okay? But it's clearly not, not something that you can... I mean, I can... Uh, even though in this example probably wasn't uh, that conclusive, but if you do... Um, if you have not just exponentials, polynomials, but maybe also trigonometric functions, and try this... I you know, it's looking everywhere. It's like, what, what function can I use, you know? And I think, uh, you see, it's... I don't know how long it may take, but at some point, if it's smart enough, you'll say, well, I don't have any explicit way of writing this, okay? All right. Um, so, that, I mean... One, th one way or the other, things don't go uh, go wrong, right? When you try to, when you rely on getting the solution explicitly. Um, so, okay. Hopefully that that kind of explains that you don't, you cannot just rely on this. So, um, what this chapter is about is is about introducing uh, the numerical ways of solving, right? So symbolically. Solving uh, f prime equals zero uh, may not be be successful, right? So you could get a message that you know just don't have enough uh, special functions, specific func specific um, names for the functions to display that. But still, the solutions do exist, and, and they have you know. There's going to be values. If you have a, if you have a parameter, uh, I think we um, said C. Let's let's do C. So C is the growth rate. Uh, for each C, there's going to be a, a maximum, right? For different Cs, there's going to be different maximum. Okay. So what's an alternate? So alternate method. Well, there's always numerical. Uh, method for finding um, roots <coughs> of uh, functions. So uh, the basic one is called the Newton's method, right? The most basic one. Let's see, how many of you have seen that in anywhere? Okay, wow, almost everybody. So um, I'm just going to mention this. That if I have a function, let's call it capital F. The reason I call this capital F is previously we had to deal with F prime equals zero, right? So sometimes we use this Newton's method for 
a function, but sometimes we use it for the derivative if we need to find maximum or minimum. Okay? So in general, this is about finding the roots of a function, and let's call it capital F. And uh, what is the, what is the uh, method doing? So the method is, let's say this is the function, the graph of the function, and it, you know, it, has a, it has a root, so it has a zero. For some x, there is, you know, the function f is zero. But you don't know what it is. You want to find out. Uh, I think we call this x star, right? So, what's the method doing? It starts with an initial. So start with an initial guess, x naught. And even this can be problematic, right? So you have to uh, know, you have to know a priori where this zero, you know, how, you know, approximately how much it is. Because there might be several zeros, right? This function might have several uh, roots, several zeros, right? So you have to be close, somewhat close to this, even though you don't know exactly what it is. But uh, you should you should start with a close value, and then um, and then perform the following operation. So, assuming that if this point were uh, well. There's a lot of exceptions to this rule. So, for instance, one, ex uh, one thing that you, uh, well, where this rule applies is at the point where uh, you have a zero, the derivative cannot be zero. Okay? So, that's kind of this picture, right? The slope is not zero here. So, it's not going to be zero in the neighborhood of this point. So, assuming this, uh, you know, you don't have a horizontal tangent at this point to start with because then it's a bad start, it's a bad guess. Okay? But if it's not zero, then it's going to intersect. the x-axis in a new point and call it x1. That will be the next iteration of this, of this, uh, of this method, of this algorithm. So you start with x, x0, you compute x1, and then you do what? Then you repeat the process, right? Is this sounds familiar? So, so then compute x1. Uh, as follows. So, what you want is you want. So this is a point where the tangent line to uh, x naught and f of x naught. That's that's the that's this point intersects. the x-axis. And when you do this computation, here's, let's see, so you do um, the slope. So the slope is is the rise. So this is f of x naught minus 0 over x naught minus x1. This is slope. And we said this has to be the equal to the derivative that's the slope of a tangent at x naught, so f prime at x naught. Okay, so when you when you do this, you get f of x naught over f of so you get x naught minus x one equals f of x naught divided by f prime at x naught. So x one is very easy to compute. It's just x naught minus f of x naught over f prime of x naught. Okay, so that's how you compute the x1, and then uh, iterate. So once you compute the x1, you're going to compute x2 in the same kind of fashion. So in general, the n plus 1 is going to be the nth xn minus f at xn 
over f prime at xn. Of course, assuming f prime of xn is not zero. So if you if you ever have if you have peaks and valleys in the neighborhood of a zero, that's this method is not going it, to it may run into one of those points and then you can no longer divide by it, right? So you have to have something that is like increasing, strictly increasing and crossing the x-axis. So um, there's a nice, nice discussion of this in, um, let's see, I posted here in the, no, in the, in the codes. Um, there's a chapter of a book, Numerical Computing, by Cliff Moller. And I, I linked here is chapter four. You can download it. Uh, it talks about various ways of, of. Um, let me see if I can do this on a. Um, talks about various ways of approximating of, of finding zeros. And let me just Newton's method is this one, right? And we just uh, wrote, of course, little f in our case is capital F. And then it shows it shows the code, what it is, um, and it also shows a few examples, like finding the square root of something, right? Square root of x. I mean, x squared minus m. When you find uh, when you set x that equal to zero, you get the square root of m and the minus square root of m, and um, and that's how the algorithm goes, right? And it's successful, so you can find the square root of two through that method, right? You, you get after a few iterations, you're very close to to that number. Uh, but it also shows an example where this kind of fails. Called, they calls it a perverse example. If it's a cube, it's like a cube root of something, right? I think this is a cube root. Then you see how this method kind of fails because it go, it goes on a tangent, then it gets here, then it goes on a tangent. It never closes and it doesn't close into the root, right, to the solution. So sometimes, if you run into such a this, uh, you know, it's it's not it's not that uh, uncommon actually for the Newton's method to have an infinite loop, right, where the values just jump around. But uh, in our code, so this is a nice thing to kind of try to uh, get, you know, uh, more familiar about. Um, this method, but here it's an implementation of that um, code of that um, Newton's method for the function f, which is the derivative, right? Okay, it's very important. I'm, I mean, I'm saying this; it's obvious, but I, I want to emphasize it because we're, we're trying to find the zero of the derivative. And remember, the last time we met. I was trying to find, I was actually showing you uh, finding a zero of a function, but I, I, should, I, was, I was supposed to look at the derivative. So anyway, so that's, so this is what this, this is what we do this, okay? Now, it's granted that this f is symbolic, right? In fact, you can, you can uh, see what happens when you don't, um, when you don't have your function given symbolically, that's that's a problem for Newton's method. Why? Because Newton's method asks you to find the derivative. So if you don't have a function symbolically, how do you find this derivative? Right? Well, you would have to do numeric comp numeric derivative differentiation. That's already, uh, you know. A topic of numerical analysis. So, so but in this case, our f was symbolic, right? We can we can see what it is. Let's see. I don't I don't want to remember. It's never a good idea to start you know your code in the middle of a of the script. Just it's best at least to run through the uh, previous cell. So you you define what need to, needs to be defined. So anyway, so this is so let's let's uh, I'm going to split this into two. So, so I'm just going to run this so you can see. Okay, so that's that's that function that we're trying to set equal to zero. That's the derivative. Okay, we can plot this if you want. Uh, 
what was the range, I don't know, 0 to 40? Okay, so you see it crosses the zero? Probably it's hard to see, but anyway, here's the zero. And it's not increasing, it's decreasing. But that doesn't, it, it's important is, thing is that it's, it's um, monotone. It has the, it's not, the derivative is never zero in this, in this area. So, um, see, I, I, using Newton's method, I picked the initial guess to be 19. Um, I guess that's just because I don't know why actually it doesn't have to be 19 it could be anywhere in this range right it could be 35 or something and let's just run this cell okay so so what this the way I wrote this code is it displays the uh, you see it displays in a kind of a fancy way so if you, if you want to learn a little bit of how to display in MATLAB you can kind of uh, read this command fprintf but bottom line is it displays the uh, number of the, uh, the index of the iteration and also the value the new value so this is x new x compared to x old minus and this is how you evaluate f at x naught and f prime at x naught I wrote f prime to be as f1 So this is f, f1 is the derivative of that derivative. So it's really the second derivative, right, of, of, the, of the profit function. Anyway, so you see how the, uh, it goes really fast. It actually converges really fast. And why do I say it converges? Because, you see, there's no pattern of kind of oscillating, right, jumping around. Okay, I mean, there is, there is a rigorous theory of why, when this Newton's method converges, but I don't think we need it here. I think it's fairly uh, obvious that, you know, that's the value, right? And this, this uses none of that Lambert, you know, none of the, those uh, exotic functions. Yes? Oh, when you use the Newton's method, is 10 a good rule of thumb, 10 steps? Uh, it, it really depends on the function. Um, yeah, how many iterations? I think it's one of those things that you just um, you just try try a few, maybe try ten. Um, ooh, I just ran the whole thing. Sorry, and um, and then you'll see. I mean, it's it's good to start low, and then ooh, I just I just told you it doesn't jump, but it, it looks like it jumps around. You see? But it jumps around a very small. I mean, does some. I mean, over here, right? So you could be comfortable in saying this method gives you an approximate solution up to I don't know how many decimals, right? Exact decimals. So I think it depends. It does even ten? It doesn't cost you to do hundred, but um, it's it's like one of those things you experiment and then you. Okay, and you don't have to display any of them, right? You can just display the last one. But you want to make sure that it's fairly close. Okay, and there are other ways to stop this. There, there are better ways to, to stop this iteration. Is when you get to a, like the difference between these two is within a, small, a certain prescribed value number. Then you say, well, I don't need any, any, any better, you know, approximation. So there's a, I think that uh, chapter in the book is uses a while loop, so you can do that too. But okay. Anyway, this so again, this takes the place of that. The takes the uh, takes place of that trying symbolically to do it symbolically, um, and this is actually important in sensitivity, as I said. I mean, I wasn't very convincing because every time I was trying to solve symbolically, it gave me this Lambert, right? But only because there was exponential and there was polynomials. But it, uh, you saw that 
or even in different machines, if you don't have that, I don't know, latest or something in the setup, uh, it might not work perfect, then you don't get a solution explicitly. Well, so, so the sensitivity, the way we do sensitivity here is already different than we did in chapter one and two. So here I start with sensitivity to this parameter. And I'm pretty sure when I wrote this code uh, in the version that was then uh, not long ago that it wasn't powerful enough to even solve this. So, so then it made even, I think my comment here was, was um, maybe right, maybe, maybe, maybe it's not accurate anymore, but um, let's run this here. So the sensitivity is now in just, so it's just in the form of a table. You see? So I just pick values for R and I do this. Okay, well, so I do this here. Yeah. So but but I, I no longer actually can take, you know, do the derivative of of x max r and divide by Right? I don't do that, that kind of formula for the sensitivity, but I can just say um, display these values in a table and maybe plot them. So plotting is, I don't know, there's just a fancy way of plotting, but it's just plotting uh, the number of optimal number of days uh, as a function of this, of this parameter, right? It's just another way of seeing this this table. And you can see it's not that different than, uh, than the, when we had linear assumption, but it's, it's, uh, it's, it's not the same. So uh, with respect to C is again a table and again a sensitivity. Okay. Again, there should be a comment, uh, you know, once you, once you're done with this and say, what what is this graph saying right it's saying that if we were wrong with that assumption from instead of 2.5 percent intrinsic intrinsic growth rate um, which gives what what it was 19 point or like 20 days right a relative change in in this by how much i don't know when we have to compute what's the relative change here versus here leads to a relative change in the number of days, okay? But it's no longer, you don't have a number, right? The homework for Monday, you still have to figure out that using that formula, right? But uh, once we, we uh, we'll, we'll, we'll soon kind of depart from the symbolic computation and just um, display our sensitivity as a table, as a, either a table or a graph and comments, right? Any questions? Uh, so I posted this code and I posted, as I said, you, if you want to read more about finding zeros of a function, you know, numerically, that chapter is a, is a great uh, resource. Uh, what we're going to be doing next, just kind of a warning, we're going to be moving to uh, two-dimensional so finding uh, zeros of systems rather than just of single fun uh, single equations. So we're going to we're going to solve numerically systems of equations, right? Instead of f equals zero, we're going to say f equals zero and g equals zero simultane simultaneously, uh, numerically. And then the, the is the same Newton's method, but it's using matrices rather than just functions, and it's going to use Jacobian of a matrix and so forth. So so um, it's good to understand this in the very in the, in the simple setting of one dimension of one equation. Okay. So this homework is due Monday, and then I'm going to post homework from Chapter Three, probably following Monday. Thank you. I, I
turned in by Homer again. Um, Your name? Nathan Brown. I may have just not heard you. Oh, yeah. I think, so. I think it's here. Yeah. 